This session is titled the Solar Software User Roundtable. And here we have folks that are using software and thinking about how to apply software to their solar businesses on a day-to-day -day basis. So we'll take a brief moment. We'll have each of these gentlemen just give a quick 30-second introduction uh, to who they are and uh, where they sit and uh, within this broader solar landscape and then start an interesting discussion from there. So Steve, you want to start sure. first? Sure. Uh, so I'm Steve Simmons. I'm the Chief Information Officer for Direct Energy Solar, uh, previously Astrum Solar. And um, we made the decision really early on to uh, build a solar platform end to end in-house on the Salesforce uh, platform. So it's really interesting to hear uh, kind of thoughts around that. And I think it was because of the time and the place and the fact that the uh, vertically uh, focused uh, solutions weren't yet available in 2010. Um, and it's certainly exciting to see where software is uh, taking us today. Fantastic. Dan? So Dan Rapp, Vivint Solar. Uh, so uh, I guess according to Jake, I guess we're a second class uh, engineering shop. <laughs> uh, and, the, and the comment actually is, is somewhat fair. Uh, but we are doing some innovative things. We uh, acquired Solmetric, uh, the makers of the Sunai, a couple years ago and are doing some very innovative things in-house, uh, developing both hardware and software. Um, and so I, I, I argue with that a bit. I do think we are a first-class engineering shop. <laughs> <laughs> sure, we'll get into that a little bit. John, do you want to? Sure. Uh, I'm John. Um, I run Solgent. Solgent is the largest pure play distribution company in the US. We serve roughly 5,000 installers and also have a uh, finance business as well that does commercial and residential finance and then a software end. And I guess in my role, I get to see what 5,000 installers across the U.S. really think about. So on the sales and marketing side, on the installation side, their pain points, their pain points per market, the innovations they're coming up with in their markets that can be transferable to other markets. Um, but I also get to see the ups and downs of the solar market. So when something hits, I get to see it across and waving across the whole, uh, the whole country, which is a fascinating aspect. Um, but in short, we spent time developing, uh, developing software internally, and we've also looked at a lot of external softwares as well because we really view ourselves as an enabler. So how do we bring the best solutions to our customer base to make sure they're successful? Um, so that's us. Sure. Finally, Brian. Good morning. I'm Brian Kelly from First Solar. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, First Solar really got into software development out of pure necessity, and there were two reasons that drove that. Uh, one is... I'm probably one of the few people here who's working almost exclusively on utility scale solar. And there just wasn't anything out there that could do what we needed in, qu in terms of fast evaluation of large utility scale projects um, in a very short time. The other thing that makes First Solar different is that we're not using silicon, as many of you probably know. We have our own thin film technology. And the available software just didn't model that accurately and unfortunately tended to underestimate our energy prediction. And so both of those factors drove us to create our own software. We've created essentially three uh, packages to think of. One is maybe lead generation. It's on our public website. Anyone can use it. And it's there to generate interest in our product and also to provide very fast um, project evaluation for someone who has a KMZ file or can find their location on a map. Then we've got a professional version of that, which our own project development teams use. And finally, we've got a very detailed uh, 8760 energy prediction tool. So those are all homegrown tools that we've made to fill a complete gap in the market. Sure. We'll, we'll try to dig a little bit into the value chain and in a bit. But first, maybe just taking a step back. You know, One thing that uh, Jake had mentioned in the last session was when, you, when he looks at the solar software space, and maybe this was a slight dig to Vivint and, and some other uh, vertically integrated companies out there, uh, but his assertion is that that solar software isn't necessarily keeping up with this broader enterprise software trend. And from your perspective, being in the software space day to day, you know, does that resonate with you? And, and if so, you know, what needs to be done there? So, I, I mean, I, I think that it certainly is uh, still behind the curve. I think we're in early days. It's like Salesforce 1999 out there. Um, and uh, there's really exciting things happening, and you can start to see the green shoots uh, coming up. But I, I wouldn't say there's a mature player in the space that solved the, the uh, solar vertical <coughs> in any, any uh, 
you know, essential way. I, I, I agree with that. Um, the, other thing, the other point that I think is worth calling out is as, a, as an integrator, as an installer, um, and not finding a, a solution that, that spans you know, from, from the initial point to the end point, uh, the problems that we face, we have to make careful selections about which problems we are going to tackle and where we're going to build our center of competencies around. Uh, would it make sense for us to, to rebuild Salesforce? Probably not, right? Does it make sense for us to invest in uh, shade analytics and design, tool, design aspects in the residential space? Well, yeah, it does, so much so that we felt it uh, essential to acquire Solmetric a couple years back. So looking at those areas where there is a, uh, a very sharp pain point that needs to be solved and one that isn't filled by another uh, company that's out there is, is where we're investing our resource. Um, from our perspective, it's been really interesting to watch the evolution. So you look at a market that's been penetrated, you know, somewhere between 1% and 5%, depending on who you ask, uh, with solar. And in the early days, it was how do you get as many megawatts as possible into the ground? You gotta, we have to show growth. We have to show a viable market. We're, we're making a market. Uh, market size that nobody even estimated possible. And so what you got was you got this build out of software systems that actually enabled that and a huge differentiator for the largest players. Um, but that differentiator is starting to come to a place where, you know, since that market penetration is there and you basically have now this tail of other companies who are starting to emerge to actually do this for the long tail. And, and, and when I guess when I think about it, I look at solar and I look at what I see in my distribution. Uh, business and what I see in our finance business. And we have this long tail of players. And I look at HVAC, I look at roofing, they also have a long tail of players. Some are larger than others, but essentially there is this very large market for development. And I think that's what we're seeing now is all those green shoots that are coming up and actually going that way. I think the biggest disadvantage today is that there's a whole bunch of green shoots and they each take a piece of the value chain, but nobody's fully pulled it together in a meaningful way. There's a lot of people very close to doing that and a lot of great work that's happened. Um, but it's disaggregated, and as a disaggregated solution, it becomes more expensive. So I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Um, so, so you mentioned these green shoots, and each of you have you know, looked, surveyed the landscape, seen that there's uh, not necessarily a solution that fits everything you need. So it, as a result, you've built your own solutions. And I'd love to just kind of think, you know, what part of the, the value chain did you decide to focus on? And, and why, you know, what sort of value or what sort of cost were you trying to tackle or what sort of advantage were you trying to get by just focusing on the places where you've decided to build your own software tool? So, Brian, maybe, maybe start with you. Yeah, I think for us it was very, like I said, we had two very clear problem statements we needed to address. And we really wanted to apply our limited resources to the parts that were specifically photovoltaic and specifically about getting accurate energy predictions out there. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to get involved in designing, you know, portals or logins or um, lead management or CRM type stuff. So we, we took off the shelf. We built actually on salesforce.com for a lot of that. And we wanted to put our um, limited resources. And the two reasons for that is first you want to, you know, keep your costs down and just focus on what you're doing that's really important. And the second is you don't want to get distracted and, you know, I've... I've I've had experience in the past of working on projects where maybe we took on too much scope. We took on things that we could have taken off the shelf. But hey, we said it's cheaper to develop it internally. Look, we can do this for so many man hours that's cheaper than paying the license. But actually, it ends up being less about the cost and more about the distraction. You really want to focus your team on the part where you're going to add the most value quickly. Mm -hmm. How does that look for some of you guys, as far as what piece of it was, was going to drive the most value for, for your businesses? It's the piece, as, as Brian mentioned, the one that causes, you know, that we are able to leverage uh, the resources we have mm -hmm. to apply it to the, to the point that we can't pull something off the shelf, or if we were to grab something off the shelf, the integration costs to do so uh, outweigh the benefit that we'd have of doing that. And so whether that's uh, sales enablement, whether that's uh, customer engagement during a relatively long life cycle of the project, or whether it's uh, you know, site analysis and uh, power generation estimate, estimating. Those are kind of the areas that we've focused on uh, to this point. Mm -hmm. I think there's one that's kind of been taken off the table for us, but I think is the kind of 
elephant in the room, which is um, that the lack of standardization around uh, permitting and interconnect um, is an awful pain point that we just assume can't be solved, and so we continue to turn the crank on the manual process over and over again, um, hoping that someday you know regulators or somebody gets rational about it. And I think of like the early days of the uh, internet sales tax, and it was an unsolvable problem. Congress kept on coming back to the internet sales tax and saying, you know, we would love to make this law, but we can't because there's no way to execute it. And software eventually came in that allowed us to execute, uh, you know, 6,500 sales tax jurisdictions with all their crazy different rules. Um, and so it seems like there's an opportunity there um, if, if somebody can kind of get the, uh, all of the domain knowledge around uh, permitting and the regulations of doing uh, solar in all the different townships and uh, counties around the uh, uh, country for, for somebody to, to emerge and similar to how sales tax kind of revolutionized uh, e-commerce. And for us, we broke it down into a few different pieces. So there's some very different use cases across the demographic. Um, I mean, installers have very different, very different issues. Some want to install, some want to sell, and they each need different software. And the real question for us is where can we make the biggest bang for, for the buck? Um, to, to me and to our team, that was really how fast can we help somebody actually learn to sell solar and actually get out there and sell it. So we've got, let's take an HVAC player who already has the demographic they want to sell to because they're talking to them daily. How do we empower them to just give a very quick proposal to know what they're talking about and to do it in less than five minutes so it's actually easy to do? And so for us, that focus was on a very quick proposal generator and then also on the back end. So to generate the bill of materials, some of the line diagrams and other things, but real realistically, all right, I've sold this, right? What do I do next? And then th that's where they do the manual piece currently. And then, you know, the next part is the equipment arrives at my job site when I want it, um, which is the logistics part. So we tell them what equipment and when, and they have this sales process that is, that is seamless and the finance process where it is seamless. So it's how do you remove the most touch points for the least complex individuals who are kind of new at the job. And that was a big focus for us as we saw growth going. And we already saw the channel created in our market, HVAC, roofing, you name it. They're touching customers day in, day out. Talk about a low cost of customer acquisition, right? But they don't know how to sell solar. Um, so making, making solutions that were easy was a real focus for how we thought about the world. Sure. And, and so just to be clear, Solagen actually built its own proposal tool in that sense. You know, as you know, in kind of including what Jake had mentioned this morning, this morning was that you know that's one of the places where we actually see a lot of third-party solutions out there. And so in that sense, and some of you are also working on more of the lead gen customer acquisition piece of it, you know, what about what you've seen in terms of third-party tools, you know, still drove you to, to build your own piece of software there? I can start with me since uh, I went last. So uh, our endeavor, we looked at the market about a year, year and a, I guess a year and a half ago, and we looked at all the solutions out there. And though we liked the teams doing it, we couldn't find a compelling solution where we could actually do what we really needed to do and or that would mold to our demographic in a meaningful way because they had other priorities. Um, what does that mean, do what you need to do specifically? So they had, they had, very, they had agendas based off some of the larger <laughs> founding customers that were working with the software. In a lot of cases, they weren't necessarily you know, as VC backed about a year and a half ago. So a lot of, a lot of our new entrants, we see, we see that they have more revenue coming in the door or more, more funding and a little bit more revenue than what we saw traditionally a year and a half ago, two years ago. And so a lot of what their agenda was, uh, was really driven by was the agenda of one or two very large customers that needed certain things. And as a, as a party, you know, one of the biggest issues is if we help them develop what becomes proprietary for us, um, how do we differentiate when we give them everything we know about our demographic that helps them with the secret sauce? And so a, a big piece of, you know, of how we thought about it was a you know how long will it take us to develop again the exact same uh, the exact same thing that Brian mentioned right what is the timeline and how do we actually think about this um, but B you know realistically speaking is there are there some very simple pain points which aren't solved which just make that the, that I guess that cycle of different things that flow chart of things you have to do much more less less elongated and then what we saw and we and that's why we endeavored on the on the software front um, and for us we're agnostic right so if we find a better solution we are 100% okay plugging it in and actually putting taking our pieces out because there are if there are teams dedicated to doing it our whole goal is to enable so we're not actually bought into just being only a software provider we're bought into making sure we serve with our solution set which is anything from finance to getting your equipment on site and issue you credit, um, we want to make sure we're giving that full solution to our dealer base. So in our case, I, I think looking at point solutions, there's a lot of interesting point solutions out there. 
but there are times when the output from a point solution needs to be integrated into other downstream processes and, and data sets and, and whatnot, right? So how, how do I take the proposal and integrate that into um, O&M estimates, right? How do I take, um, you know, design and integrate that into, uh, you know, the redesign chain or the re-permitting chain, those types of things. And so I can focus on a point solution. I can do the integration work necessary to pull that in and make it work in the business processes for that limited set, but can I make it work in a, in a broader context in a company? And, and so that, that's one aspect of it. Another aspect, I think, is that as you go through periods of rapid growth, oftentimes rather than picking up a software solution that may or may not integrate well with you, it's easier to scale with people, Excel, paper, pencils, right? And, and a business um, that's focusing on, on revenue and, and uh, you know, megawatts on the roofs, oftentimes will choose the path of least resistance or the path, path of quickest solution, which may leave a software solution behind for a certain period of time until uh, the business maturity catches up enough to start focusing on those aspects. What's the pain point that you need to see? You know, that's, that's kind of almost counterintuitive that you start to scale first with. Well, so it, it depends, right? If, if I have a software development or a software integration lifecycle that's going to take a quarter to turn around, but I have a market opportunity that I can tackle in you know a couple weeks to a month. I I may choose the uh, expeditious path in those situations. <laughs> I think the other thing that um, as the solar industry has uh, been been born and started to uh, grow up, I, I think we're all looking for that you know proprietary competitive advantage. Um, so we certainly built our platform with the intent of getting a competitive advantage over our. Uh, you know, competitors, mm -hmm. and whether or not they, those competitive advantages that started or that we thought were going to be the key differentiators for us um, are what are going to be continuing into the future as a mature market uh, comes, comes uh, into existence, I think is really a good, good question. And so uh, it seems like, uh, you know, we're all investing not small amounts of money into doing these proprietary solutions. Um, none of which I think individually are what, you know, if we all pulled our, our capital and built the industry standard solution uh, would be achievable, but we all believe and are holding on to these proprietary advantages. Even our processes are different. Our, so, I mean, if you look at the SaaS solutions, the challenge we have and the reason we say, well, it doesn't really fit is because our business processes and our, you know, uh, behaviors as, as a business don't mesh to... Uh, the process that that SaaS solution was built upon, and so we look at it and go, well, that doesn't meet meet my need. It might meet, you know, to, to John's point, might meet, you know, one of their original customers' needs, but their process was different too because they thought they had a competitive advantage by doing something just slightly different. Uh, where where or how they do the design, or where or how they, uh, you know, sell selling the home, or what their method is for acquiring their customers, or what their, I mean, uh, operations team needs in order to pro uh, project manage their, you know, teams in the field. Uh, we all have these things that we're holding on to as, you know, we're going to get an edge on other people by doing it. And uh, the kind of standardization implied by a SaaS solution is, is something that doesn't necessarily play well while the market is still trying to figure out uh, kind of a, a standardized uh, process. Right. I mean, I, I think that brings up the point that now that you have these proprietary solutions, there's also this cost of, of mm -hmm. switching. That's because you're your entire business is based on this proprietary solution. So does that, does that basically preclude you from looking at third-party solutions at this point, or does that increase the hurdle uh, in which you can even adopt a, a third-party solution at this point? Yeah, if I can comment on that. <coughs> oh, sorry. Go ahead, Brian. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, one of the things we've accomplished with this software so far is scale, and, and it's scale that is low cost, and it's also international, and it's also 7 by 24. So, you know, in our public-facing tool, we get maybe a 1,000 designs per month that people around the world and every continent are doing. And they're doing them on their own, and they're getting really good information back. And it's not taking any operational expense, or it's not running into time zone conflicts or anything like that. The system just runs constantly. Mm -hmm. So I feel you know that's bringing a lot a lot of value. It's maybe getting our product in front of a lot more of the market. Hopefully, generating leads. If we need to switch platform, I think that's okay. I think the fact that it's you know proprietary is is okay because we've now got a place where people go. URLs are kind of easily transferable, 
Um, but if we've got this capability and people are finding how to use it to make their business run better, then yeah, the, the platform can change. So from your standpoint, it almost seems like because it is just more of a market education tool, it seems like it stands on its own. There's really not a whole lot of costs involved with switching. It's not really integrated into the process of developing. Yeah, and maybe there my comments were around our public-facing version. Yeah. Our, our professional version maybe is a little more locked in with more APIs to different uh, data sources and the Salesforce platform. Um, but, but certainly I would think about it in the same way because the value, the potential value and the, the value we're already seeing is so great. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering if you guys are concerned in the sense that, okay, let's say someone does develop this killer solution or this ecosystem of, um, you know, that, that, you know, just enables, you know, to bring up the disrupt word again, you know, is disruptive and allows residential installers or DG installers to, to be that much more efficient. Like, is that, a, is that an issue in your mind that, that you're not going to be able to switch quickly enough to this new platform that might be a lot better than your current solutions? I think that's an issue regardless of whether it's internally developed or whether you buy it off the shelf, right? Mm -hmm. um, one, if whatever software you put in place, uh, there is inertia, uh, there is entrenchment that needs to be overcome in looking at another solution. You just need to be uh, diligent and, and watchful to look at the trends and if you see something that is going to be disruptive, that you're not disrupted by it, but mm -hmm. you're able to leverage that, right? And that's the great thing about software, right, is it, it does move a little quicker than hardware. <laughs> uh, I would say I'd be excited by it, right? So, I mean, for me, what's interesting is we have a channel. That channel can sell, you know, anything from light bulbs, IoT. I mean, anything you can imagine. And when they touch the home, they can do, they can do anything, right? And so the question is, how do you actually disrupt? Solar is a way in that costs, let's say, thirty thousand dollars. Now with paste, you can bundle, you know, anything else. You want an HVAC, you want a new roof. I mean, you can just start loading this mm -hmm. thing up. And as solar prices fall, right, it becomes less and less. You know, your cost of acquisition and your cost to actually service become more and more of a percentage, right? So for me, any new technology that helps me actually help the channel significantly is actually really, really powerful. And that goes not just for solar, that goes for how you bundle home improvement and the, the Internet of Things, essentially, um, which I believe is the next big trending piece. Because the demographic buys all of this and will buy it in a bundle. I mean, a Nest system is way more sexy than seeing solar on your roof but not having a way to interact with it, right? So, you know, the sexy part of it has actually been left out in solar. And if we, we can actually make solar sexy, essentially, by doing all these other things in the home and adding it in as far as uh, as far as dollar value into these low cost loans, um, I think the other part of it is for me, it's about having channel and making sure that you're empowering that channel because I'm not necessarily selling B to B to C. I'm selling B to B, and my my B to C guys, they all have channel, and they have different types of channel. But it's giving them those solutions that enable them. That's really really powerful, and then they should be able to sell. And when you look at their cost structure, their cost structure for install. I think when I actually do the math on some of my guys who are, you know, if they were to say, oh, you just want to go at current steady state and grow organically, 250 or under for install, right? I mean, and, and we're talking, that is, that is beating, when you look at everybody else in the space, beating everybody significantly. I actually think they can be 150 or under um, in the very near future. So I think there's this interesting gap. But that's also because I see all their cost structures and understand how they could go about doing that. But I, I really feel that if you do it effectively, when you already don't have a, you don't have a cost of customer acquisition, when you're in a localized market, when you have traditional marketing versus versus these high cost things where you have to penetrate across the US to be successful. Um, there's, there's a lot of potential for, for this demographic, and it has one traditionally. And the only thing I see that could really disrupt it massively is, is the evolution of the internet, right, and how customer acquisition happens online. Um, but still, I mean, you trust the local installer more, and you need a very big brand to disrupt online. So if I was called, if I called myself, I mean, you know, pick a nice brand like Sharp, then maybe I'd have a chance of disrupting online even more effectively because I had the trust of the customer. And if I'm local, I have the trust of the customer. So for me, again, all about the fact that if I can get disruptive technology that I can add into a solution, I can empower the channel, and it won't disrupt us because we have, we have a panoply of different options that we're pushing through that channel. Yeah, I'm hoping maybe we can also touch base on, since you guys have, you know, certainly throughout building your own uh, software tools as well as uh, just evaluating what's out there. Um, I think Paul mentioned earlier, it's just, you know, sometimes it's, it's not just about software 
being so, you know, software and it's automatically going to solve. It's also about building the process around there. So I'd love to hear you know, some, sort of, you know, some of your, your lessons learned as you guys have developed your own software tools or evaluated what's out there. And you know, maybe think about you know, what the industry can, can avoid as, as we build the next generation software. You guys are all smiling, which I know <laughs> means that there's Lots there's painful there's memories coming yeah. up here. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, there's a, there's a couple of points I would make. I mean, you know, I've been I've, I'm not a software person by by background, but I've been involved with software development projects for 20 years at, at first Solar and before that at Intel. And you know, there's a few pain points, cert, few few things that I will certainly avoid going forward, right? One has been having very long Gantt charts, big project <laughs> plans stretching out, you know, 12 months into the future, how we're going to end up in this perfect state in 12 months' time. And it's never really worked out like that. And particularly in solar, the pace of change of the business means that wherever you think the goalposts are in 12 months' time, they're not going to be there. They're going to be somewhere else. And it's always surprising, but it always happens. So. Um, and actually, a lot of the first solar, uh, some of the key team members are down there, kind of smiling at me here. But um, I think this Scrum methodology of um, you know agile software development and turning out um, useful improvements every couple of weeks. I, I don't know if you use something like that, but certainly that has been a game changer in my mind to avoid that pain point. And the other point, if I could just make it, is and it relates a lot to Paul's presentation earlier. You know, the software is necessary but never sufficient. And getting people to change the way they do work to exploit the power of the software is often harder than, than developing the software. Um, but you have to do it. The benefits come when, when the work is done differently and when the customer in the end is seeing a better, better information or better service because of uh, the software. They're able to make, make better decisions, make them earlier, make them cheaper. And that's where the value comes. But it requires behavioral changes as much as it requires software. I think the uh, biggest lesson that um, needs to be learned over and over again by every software development shop is you think of like the uh, Salesforce.com, and one of their big inspirations was Facebook. Right here, they're enterprise software, and they're taking inspiration from a consumer-facing. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, brand and platform, and uh, you look at Slack and it, it revolutionizing things because it's so user centric. And I think that the, a lot of the software that's available today is kind of uh, functional and top down in a vision of being able to meet the pain points of solar. But we aren't at a state yet where we're mature enough to really be a user centric um, uh, solutions. And so when, when you look out um, and, and say, if I'm a solar salesperson, you know, I, I'm I'm, I'm thinking of you know Viva or Guidewire, like uh, we were talking talking about before. Um, they they were truly revolutionary because they were cu customer driven, because they were user centric, because they uh, came in and understood the actual needs of the person on the the uh, street and met that in a in a new way that was outside of what the industry norms were used to. And I think it's the same thing if you think of like the solar proposals. Uh, you know, there are a dime a dozen. There's uh, you know a hundred of them out there that have called me up and said you should use our proposal. Um, but when our salespeople look at them, they're, they're like, you know, this isn't compelling. This isn't going to get our value proposition across mm -hmm. in the home. Mm -hmm. It's just it, it doesn't have the have the pop that gets them saying, hey, we need this. You know, I, I want this. So if you can get, you know, my sales team telling me this is going to revolutionize my my business, that's much more compelling than saying, hey, look, I've got a feature where I can drop a picture in over here and I can stick a logo over here. And now, you know, we have a solar proposal. Um, and I think that there's a, there's a big message in uh, being able to be that grassroots driven organization and having the tool set that is um, not inflexible but actually gives the, the user the ability to customize and to, to drive you know, their particular voice through to their, their customer in a unique way. I'm curious, not to, not to keep beating up on proposal generators, software. It's easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we're going to have a session later this afternoon that goes into that early customer engagement piece. Uh, but you know, what will make it pop? You know, what's missing out there that, that your sales guys need? Uh, you know, I, I think that solar is interesting because it's, it's still a, a market that requires education. 
the average time you sit down with a, a customer in the home, we all have different ways we sell it. Either we refuse to sell solar or we sell power because it's easier. People understand 12 cent power, so we sell a PPA because I don't feel like getting into the solar conversation. Or you know, one way or the other, we're trying to package it up to, to limit the amount of education required, but we're all kind of aware of the fact that at some level, it's still an education process. And so to the degree that we as an industry can get uh, you know, the American uh, public kind of educated so that it's no longer, you know, looking to get market penetration, but actually is a mainstream phenomenon people are looking. Turning that, that around, I think, is, is a, a big piece of it. I think the proposal is uh, kind of the weakest tool in that, in that uh, you know, effort, but it's, it's something that's within our control, and so we focus on it. Um, but I think it's, re it's reflective of the fact that we, we still have not gotten an educated public. So broader market education versus just the, a nice looking proposal. Then. Yeah. I think some of it uh, as well, though, is, you know, Paul made a good point of, of the juxtaposition of technology versus innovation, right? Mm -hmm. and, and using the uh, example of industrialization of, mm -hmm. uh, of factories. Um, if you look at the energy market, I can't sell a customer a red electron versus a green electron. You know, what they're concerned about is if I hit the light switch, the, power, the lights come on, right? But I think, there's, I think there's opportunity for innovation in the product itself. Uh, the idea of smart energy or putting energy and power at that, you know, in, into the consciousness and at the fingertips of the end customer. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, it's really the combination of the technologies, the underlying technologies, the solar panels, the inverters, racking, you know, whatever else, but also the software that you build on top of that, you know, layer on top of that, mm -hmm. to build a product that has um, a, a different, you know, place in the in the customer in the end customer's customer's mindset. I think once we start doing that effectively, and you're starting to see some uh, some traction in, in that area in a little bit, uh, but once that's done effectively, I think you'll start seeing uh, some some innovation on top of just you know, ro rolling the technology train forward. Does that come out of the solar space? Does that come out of more of the gen general smart energy space? Or, or how does that, how do we grow that? Um, so that's the, that's the, you know, billion dollar question, right? <laughs> <laughs> Jake, are you listening? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think what we have is solar 1.0. Right, and I think, if I remember right, that was kind of the theme of the conference last year, right, is solar mm -hmm. 2.0. Um, but I think you'll start seeing some, some people that have had some experience in the, in the solar field, uh, whether it's in some of the entrenched companies, whether it's in new, com you know, new startup companies, start to make some traction in that area. Um, but I do think that is, that's the, that's the billion dollar question. This is something you think, you mentioned all these you know, HVAC uh, folks, the you know, other folks that are in the home. Is this something that they're thinking about? Is this something that they're trying to you know, tie solar in with the customer um, from, a, from a software perspective? Yeah, I, I think every, so I think the big question has always been how do you actually captivate the homeowner so that you have a captive customer that you can actually essentially be the concierge service to for the rest of their life, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, what we see is we see a build out in every industry and, and you have this technology curve, which is general technology across all industries and you see this just tearing up over time and then disseminating through every industry um, and actually changing it. And then you see in solar specifically, you see the technology starting with this, you know, anything from a proposal, getting down to a, you know, specking the full system and then getting down to the homeowner. And I think th the real big piece, and I really do think it's really important, is how do we give every homeowner something they interact with? That when they think of solar or they think of energy efficiency, they, they think of it's a box or it's a, you know, whatever it might be. And I'll go back to the Nest thought, right? Like people love their Nest app, they love their Nest toy, you know, and they, they like actually interacting in a meaningful way with that. So if you were able to tie the whole house together on your phone, which is essentially your interface for pretty much everything these days, um, then you would actually have a captive customer where you could give them advice. You could use your monitoring systems that you have in place for solar or other things to actually give them suggestions on, you know, power usage, operations and maintenance, you name it. So the real catch is, 
there's really nothing that's done a great job. There's a few platforms beginning, but done a great job pulling together all these pieces with open APIs that then becomes the standard. And when you actually look at the cost of it, we're talking about another software solution, right? It's on the phone. It's not hardware. There's some hardware involved, but it can be anywhere, anybody's hardware, right? Every inverter today, not every, but almost every inverter today has some sort of API feed that you can pull on and is connected to the home, right? You know, you've got, you know, when you look at all these, I mean, I'll go back to Nest, when you look at the platforms that are out there, whether it be Nest or somebody else, they have API feed. Right, and they're all open. And so, to me, something that pulls that all together is actually kind of going to be the billion dollar, the billion dollar answer that actually then allows for these concierge services and actually is captivating the homeowner. And I think that will occur on the phone. I don't think it's going to occur on another piece of software um, or hardware, rather. Um, and I think that's really kind of open. And we thought a lot about that, and we are trying to make sure that we are actually bringing technology that we see to market to actually into our pipeline for our customer base to do exactly this, so that they have captive customers. Um, and that we can help them really drive their market. And, and you know, when you think about referrals, um, they're the cheapest way to acquire new customers. When you think about upselling and actually doing it digitally with just algorithms, cheapest way of actually driving new business. So there's all these pieces of potential options there. Sure. Uh, so we're going to have some uh, a few minutes or more than a few minutes for questions. So get ready with those questions. Uh, we'll have some mics being passed around. So raise your hand and get one of those mics. But before we, we get to the audience Q&A, so one question, a lot of what we focus on is on the customer piece, you know, market education, customer acquisition even going towards proposal. And Jonathan, you brought up uh, the, the operations, the asset management side of things. Um, earlier, we heard, Jake, that you should be on the opposite end, maybe start from there. But I'm curious to hear your guys' take on uh, app asset management platforms that are out there today and uh, what's needed there or if they're perfectly fine. If I can make one comment on that, right, in the utility space, you know, the prices we're seeing for utility solar power are, are incredibly low. I think they've come much lower, much faster than anyone expected. And so the ability to learn from installed power plants and use that as a basis for whether it's you know, big data, learning about plant configuration, location, um, or whether it's learning about operational efficiencies, um, energy availability, those types of things. I think that's really important. And you know, when we compare in the utility space, let's say the benefits, if, if you could take $50,000 out of the cost of acquiring a 50 megawatt project, that's worth about 0 0.1 cents per watt, right? Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, it's good, it's $50,000, you should try to save it, but it's not, it's not moving the needle very much in terms of the overall cost structure. But if you can find a way to extract 1% you know, more energy, 5% more energy from that power plant, that really moves the needle. And when we're looking at PPAs in the order of you know, 5, 4, and even 3 cents per kilowatt hour, we need to use the learnings and we need to use the data that's coming out of operational power plants to drive that learning process. So, uh, the, your question on whether you know what's what's attractive in the OM space from a software perspective, I'm not seeing a platform that I that I like right now. Um, the comment was made earlier in, the, in one of the sessions that this is probably the only group that looks at um, customer acquisition as a sexy problem. <laughs> uh, but I don't think there's very many people here that look at O&M even in this group as a sexy problem. Good point. Right. <laughs> not going <laughs> to lie. <laughs> <laughs> just, no, I just thought you just sold, <laughs> sold the product and that's it. Right? <laughs> but, but the fact of the matter is, as we start deploying more solar, um, it will start to become a sexy problem. And it's, it's a problem that I think a few people are looking at, um, maybe a little bit ahead of the game, so to speak, mostly because there's just not enough out of there and people are worried about customer acquisition and getting megawatts installed. That it's not hitting most people's radar just now. But it's a problem that's, that's coming. And it's a problem, I think, Brian, as you mentioned, if you can extract an additional 1% or 5% from a well-operated fleet, mm -hmm. if your fleet you know, is gigawatts, Installed, that's a significant amount of money to be made. So when you say you don't like any of the solutions you see, what are they missing? Uh, so one of, the, one of the key problems, at least in residential, uh, is just keeping in contact with your fleet, right? Coming from, a, coming from an internet world, if I have uh, two nines of reliability, I'd be laughed out of you know, a technical conference. I, I would bet money that there's not 
any operator out here that has two nines of reliability for a distributed fleet today. I may be wrong on that, but I, I'm, I'm pretty certain from you know, the interactions I've had within the industry and, and O&M conferences and whatnot that that, that type of reliability is, is what we're looking at, you know, so subpar. That's a huge problem. And I don't just even on the communications? Just on the communications. I don't know if the, I don't know if the asset's operating. I really don't. And that's, that's a big issue. <laughs> Any other thoughts on asset management o &M? Sure. Um, I mean, so, A, I do think asset management is a sexy business. Um, <laughs> you know, so I think that I'm, I'm a little bit differentiated in that sense, um, probably not positively. Um, but when I look at what that means in general, right, we're building, we're building a fleet where we're building a lot of uh, installed systems that are early stage, right? They're going to need a lot of help. They're going to need a lot of up, upgrading and updating. It's also the best way to kind of upsell or, or do something else. When you look at traditional O&M businesses, you see somewhere in the neighborhood of 60% gross margin, right? So they're very high gross margin businesses. Um, and essentially, I think software can do a majority of the monitoring and do it algorithmically. So as long as you actually can touch, you can touch your system uh, digitally, then there's this huge opportunity to basically remove every aspect of the hard, the hard pieces and actually drill, not necessarily all the hard pieces, but really drive the analytics automatically and just have a truck automatically sent out based off those heuristics. And you know, if you have enough sample size, you can run learning algorithms across your sample size to know what actually was driving it and what it looks like and, and essentially have really, really smart thinking around O&M. So I think there's this huge opportunity. And if we all believe that solar is going to grow rapidly, then we should all believe that the opportunity around O&M is significant, um, just because it makes sense. And it certainly seems to have higher margin than, than, a, lot of, uh, than a lot of our uh, current installers and sales forces in solar, which is interesting. So from us, from a standpoint of, of what we have with a 5,000 installer network, you know, essentially knowing how well each installer does in installation, we also know how well they can do on O&M and can divvy out O&M work. So when we look at a very low cost coverage, model for the US, you know, we're not necessarily the software side, but when we look at the low cost coverage model for the US on O&M, we actually have great aptitude for doing something of that nature because we know how all of our installers function in what markets and how to be effective at a very low cost. So it's also exciting because I can then empower and give work to our installers who are high quality and actually help them grow their businesses. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, turn it over to audience Q&A. If you have a question, we have one right up front here. We have a mic that's coming around. Oh, hold on one second, just for the mic. Hi, folks. Uh, is it on? I'm the CEO for PV Complete. We're a solar design platform. And one thing that really concerns me is that we're lowering soft costs. We're not just shifting them to another part in the workflow. And um, when I look at those great slides on, um, on where our soft costs are, so many things are lumped into overhead and into, you know, there's overhead and margins. I'm like, what's that? And so my question to you folks, having this great panel on the stage, is are you tracking those soft costs? So when I can help you lower them, do you have those numbers internally? Uh, I, so for us, yes, we do track those. So we, we break down the overhead cost uh, to a fairly fine level of detail. So when we're looking at, at um, either selecting a software platform or building it ourselves, we do look at the impact that it has on the overall dollar per watt and whether or not it truly is just a shell game of moving costs you know, from one cost center to another or whether it's truly reducing the, the overall cost. Yeah, for us, I think on a project by project, each project will have its own budget for what you might call soft costs. That's after the project has started, of course. For the part before that, maybe the marketing and business development side, much less so. Great. Another question up here in the center. I wanted to focus on O and M. I think uh, I think captivation and O and M's uh, a really sexy problem as well. And, uh, but I, I think we have a really interesting uh, predicament in in the industry where we've created kind of an, an absurd uh, uh, sense of warranty, and and it's complicated because we want systems that are going to last for a long time. But if you look at anything parallel in the electrical industry, anything else, you know, there's nothing comparable to you know, 10, 20, 25 year warranties. And frankly, you know, I, it's a, you know, it's a broad discussion, but I think it's kind of unsustainable. Um, and it creates for integrators a really interesting predicament where customers have this really long-term expectation for a lot of free service. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're in the midst of how we transition that, how we introduce different products that 
that sort of solve that, that create a stickier customer. But I'd just be really interested to hear what you guys think with similar problems. Uh, I, I do think it's a problem. I, I do think it's a problem of setting a, expectations that can be met with the customer and that we can fulfill on, right? Um, I, I think it's, a, it's an area, it may not be as easy to sell into as customer acquisition, but it's an area that I think can be addressed by a um, joint technolo technology solution between software, hardware, uh, some big data aspects. Um, and, and some operational efficient, you know, oper crisp operational execution. So I think that it actually is more of a commercial concern. I don't think there's uh, a lot of technical limitations, uh, but when you're asking somebody to sign a 20-year financing agreement, um, they want to know that you're going to back that product and they're going to end up with a non-functioning system on the roof when they're still paying a monthly payment. And so I think that we've kind of become a victim of our own uh, success because we, we got financing in order to make solar mainstream. We're now suffering under the, the weight of offering somebody a service for 20 years that we have to maintain the hardware uh, to support it. And I think it is a, a growing uh, aspect of the business that we should be thinking about how, uh, what, what the real costs are of uh, O&M and seeing how, how that's treated across the, the industry. And is that through just better hardware, better business operations, or is there a piece that technology, software can play a role too? I mean, yeah, I'm sure there's, there's definitely, uh, we, we built part of our in-house platform we built was the asset management so we could keep track of all of our assets in the field, we could see the monitoring, we knew when to send a truck. Um, but I, I still think that there's an overlying uh, commercial concern around the value proposition to the customer and, and, and how we approach the marketplace as a solar industry. I was just going to mention, one of the things I think we saw is we saw the evolution of solar really come from a world of PPAs, right? When bringing finance and software to this industry, it was game changing. And with that, um, essentially we saw these warranties that, that uh, paralleled the PPA time period. What's interesting is that's actually not necessarily normal in these other industries as mentioned. And therefore, when selling in localized markets and selling loans, which are proliferating a lot quicker now across the board um, than, than they used to be, um, you're not actually necessarily having to make some of the same expectations. And so there is the standard, but that standard doesn't necessarily have to be the standard for which every installer goes out and sells with a new lo loan product. A lot, of, a lot of what I want to know as a consumer is, all right, well, I get my payback before this thing crashes, right? At worst case scenario, am I OK? Um, and so if my payback period is actually covered by my, my warranty period, I actually feel good. Now, I can buy another incentive package that gives me another elongation period for you know, years 10 through, you know, through 20, and I'm actually willing to pay that, which is, you know, in a lot of cases, I've watched our customers actually be willing to pay that because it's not that much. And when you actually think about equipment, equipment costs are following so quickly that, you know, tw 10 years from now, how much does an inverter really cost, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to be all that much. The real, the real question there, which I worry about in O&M, that, that we don't really talk about much, is if I'm having to pull off an inverter, A, do I have compliant equipment to put in this place? B, did I just violate every building code possible in my local jurisdiction by switching it out and now have to change the whole system, which is, you know, it's still an unknown to me. Um, you know, and the real or third part is, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it. And, and the third part is now the labor cost, right? So I've got to send a truck out to actually go do that. What percentage of my cost is labor and how, how long do I have to spend out there if I'm dealing with some of these other hurdles? And I think, I think we, will see, we will see some of these aspects pop up over time. Um, some have designed around this as well, but, but not many. Sure, and so I think we're getting into some broader industry issues as a whole that goes beyond Sorry. solo software. So maybe that's a good place to, to stop for this morning. We're headed directly into a networking break, but in 30 minutes we'll be back and talking about how software gets into finance. So uh, in the meantime, please give these gentlemen a round of applause. <laughs>